Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are terrible for the environment. It's an extremely inefficient way of conducting transactions. It's a way to both hide dirty money and destroy the environment at the same time. The environmental attacks on Bitcoin are best understood as a strategy by economic, media, and political elites to undermine a form of money they can't control. Critics distort the basic facts about what's known as Bitcoin mining, the process through which a global network of computers maintain the Bitcoin network through computation. Though energy intensive, this process is what makes Bitcoin a truly decentralized monetary system. The amount of energy that's consumed in processing those transactions is staggering. A single Bitcoin transaction, that's one purchase or one sale or one transfer, uses the same amount of electricity as the typical U.S. household uses in more than a month. I think the estimate is 53 days. Wow. Yeah. They devise this per transaction energy cost figure, and then they extrapolate Bitcoin's transactional load to hundreds of billions per year. Nick Carter is a partner at Castle Island Ventures. He's written a series of influential articles about Bitcoin and energy. On the basis of this somewhat um, you know, illusory uh, per transaction energy cost figure, uh, they assume that Bitcoin will grow rapaciously in its energy footprint. In fact, as the Bitcoin network grows to support additional transactions, it doesn't require additional energy. Just as the Federal Reserve Building's electricity bill doesn't increase with every ATM withdrawal. The electricity consumed by mining isn't used to power individual transactions. It's used to secure and administer the foundation layer of Bitcoin's monetary network, which can then be extended almost infinitely. Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin's energy use are not really correlated. An additional marginal transaction doesn't really add much energy outlay to the Bitcoin system. The energy used by Bitcoin miners has increased significantly and it will continue to grow. But the media's claims are outlandish. In 2017, Newsweek boldly predicted that Bitcoin was on track to consume all of the world's energy by 2020. One of the most commonly cited figures comes from a 2018 two-page analysis published in Nature Climate Change and trumpeted by the New York Times and other outlets. Bitcoin's growth could single-handedly push global temperatures above the tipping point of two degrees Celsius. Effectively, it makes some very questionable assumptions about Bitcoin to drive this extrapolation of Bitcoin's future carbon footprint. It finds this cartoonish figure that Bitcoin uh, could increase the world's temperature by two plus degrees, uh, which is completely inconsistent with the way Bitcoin works. Nature Climate Change went on to publish three rebuttals, pointing out the implausible assumptions used to generate its figure including the same fallacy of calculating an energy cost per Bitcoin transaction and then assuming a linear increase as the network grows. So how much energy does Bitcoin mining actually consume? The Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance estimates Bitcoin uses just over 100 terawatt hours per year, which is less than gold mining and many other residential and industrial activities. Critics routinely invoke the idea that Bitcoin uses more electricity than whole countries to generate attention-grabbing headlines. But that's also true of many industries. And if Bitcoin were a country, it would rank 32nd out of 59 tracked by the Cambridge Center. And for what it's worth, Bitcoin's market cap is over a trillion dollars, far more than the GDP of many of the countries to which it's compared. Critics also tend to ignore that miners are incentivized to use energy that would otherwise go to waste. That's because electricity is hard to transport over long distances, while Bitcoin mining can happen anywhere that there's internet access. So miners gravitate toward energy sources with excess capacity. They will go to the Amazon, they will go to the Congo, they will go to Sub Siberia, they will go to Antarctica, go to the middle of the ocean. They'll go wherever the cheapest energy is. Alex Gladstein is Chief Strategy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation. He points out that Bitcoin miners lose money in competitive electricity markets because the cost of the power they consume exceeds their earnings. Bitcoin miners can only pay like two to five cents per kilowatt for the energy. Industrial nations, consumers pay 10, 15 cents. And in developing countries, they pay 20 to 40 cents. What I'm concluding here with is that Bitcoin miners need 
like energy that nobody else wants. In the Western United States, mobile Bitcoin miners are already running on electricity derived from unused natural gas from oil wells that can't be captured because there are no pipelines to carry it. Gladstein argues that Bitcoin can be used as a spur to develop more renewable energy in underdeveloped countries, remote locations, and even existing landfills. A recent industry survey put Bitcoin mining sustainable energy use at around 56% a figure that will likely grow. Bitcoin miners are like a sponge. Any excess energy bubbling to the point where it becomes cheap enough for them, they will soak it up. There are computers all over the world right now spitting out random numbers around the clock in a competition to try to solve a useless puzzle. The claim that Bitcoin mining is useless is the essence of the government's case against Bitcoin because it's this component that directly challenges state power. The work being carried out by this global computer network is what allows Bitcoin to be controlled by mathematical rules instead of human actors vulnerable to government or corporate control. Bitcoin is a vote of no confidence in the monetary and financial system that exists today. This pretty exclusionary system where we are extremely beholden to the opinions of a half dozen individuals who all think the same way. Would you go so far as to say it's, it's almost like a generational movement? against the status quo in favor of a non-inflationary kind of hard currency. Absolutely. And it's not just non-inflationary, it is a non-discretionary monetary rule. There's no central banker that can come in and alter the rules and privilege one certain set of society at the expense of another. That is the core of the movement here. Some historians believe that there have been periods in history when people had greater financial education than the general public has today. One such period was during the great times of ancient Greece, particularly in Athens. Athens in 400 BC was very special and remains special to our history because this is where democracy was invented. Their democracy was different from our modern times democracy, though, particularly when it comes to the involvement their citizens had in the day-to-day -day activities of the democracy. Athens had created a complex system of bankers and insurers to simplify the trade of grain and increase the security of investors' portfolios. Many ships sunk in the Aegean Sea during these times. These financial instruments allowed to protect one's investment and share the risk of their business with the industry through insurance. Of course, there were often disputes around these topics that needed to be settled in court. The court system in Athens was built to accommodate this particular type of issue and was used for every other topic too. Here are a few rules on how their court system worked. First, the jury was composed of 500 citizens per trial, chosen randomly from society. Then, the maximum length of the trial was one day, the matter was settled at the end of the day. The jury did not deliberate together, they voted. And the defendant and plaintiff represented themselves, but sometimes had their speeches written out by famous orators. The first point is important to the argument of this video. 500 people in the jury of each trial. At the time, Athens had 50,000 citizens and 100,000 slaves living within the city walls. They were not counted as citizens and did not take part in the decisions of the city. So 500 people in each trial was 1% of the population. Imagine this in today's world. 3.3 million Americans would have to be part of each jury, or 14 million Chinese citizens would be involved. Sounds impossible, although we do have one technology that didn't exist in Athens that could simplify the matter, the internet. Maybe this kind of jury could be readapted today. The outcome of trials wouldn't be the source of such debate because 1% of randomly selected individuals can be considered a big enough sample to represent society as a whole for a given trial. Beyond leading to a fair trial system, it also leads to more transparency and lowers the powers of influence that sometimes exist for these important trials. In his lifetime, the average Athenian attended multiple trials, including the complex ones, and faced topics such as finance, risk, long-term investment, compounding, etc. Today we still have records of such trials. One example is the story of Demosthenes, Athenian that had his heritage stolen by his uncles because he was too young when his father died. As an adult, he took his uncles to trial. Here's an extract of his depiction of the situation. My father, man of the jury, left two factories both doing a large business. One was a sword manufactory, employing 32 or 33 slaves, most of them worth 5 or 6 mine, each and none worth less than 3 mine. From these, my father received a clear income of 30 mine each year. 
The other was a sofa manufactory, employing 20 slaves given to my father as security for a debt of 40 miney. These brought him in a clear income of 12 miney. In money he left as much as a talent loaned at the rate of a drachma a month, the interest of which amounted to more than 7 miney a year. Now, if you add to this last sum the interest for 10 years, reckon at a drachma only, you will find that the whole principal and interest amounts to 8 talents and 4,000 drachmae. How many average citizens of our modern world would be able to follow such an argument? It mentions two businesses, loans, interest rates and their compounding effects. Today, most people don't understand what compound interest is, and it is one of the most simple long-term thinking concepts in finance. Our financial system has been layered with many levels of complexity and is presented as a complex topic, including when it comes to personal finance. I believe this has been done through time by the people working in the industry for two reasons. First, by making individuals believe it is a complex topic, they will hire professionals to manage and custody their funds. Two, governments can give the impression of being in control of our financial system and force their citizens to rely on their expertise thereby lowering their personal engagement. Today, people start to understand the impact inflation can have on their lives. They don't necessarily understand where it comes from, but they understand that they need to do something about their personal finance or their savings will slowly be crushed by inflation. This inflationary way of thinking has always been there. This is part of the reason why people invest in real estate and has pushed the prices so high. Today, it is pushing people towards even riskier investments. This is part of the reason why the cryptocurrency world sees such a boom and seems so attractive to many. High reward, but also high risk. People entering crypto will slowly start making the distinction between Bitcoin and crypto at some point, often because of a shitcoin losing 99% of its value or a hack making them lose their funds. We will write a follow-up article and video about this topic in particular. Bitcoin is not crypto. Because of the way Bitcoin is built, People gain their financial independence. You are the sole owner of your assets and no one can take control of your assets unless you give access to them. This is extremely empowering, but can also be a scary endeavor. It has the potential of opening users up to more risk. This means that people need to take responsibility for their financial decisions. Every decision is their own and in order to avoid mistakes, people need to educate themselves. This education starts with understanding Bitcoin wallets, but quickly moves on to more complex topics, and many more that one by one open up the mind to the way our financial system works. There are many great thinkers and contributors in the space that help understand these points. People are now forced to take control of their own funds and take responsibility for their personal finance. The veil that has always laid on the world of finance is slowly being lifted, and what used to be seen as very complex topics are becoming day-to-day -day topics for many. This is due to the fact that the trust that could once be relied upon our centralized financial institutions is now gone because of decades of abusing customers, bailout, and more. The Athenian system was not able to scale with the growing number of people in cities and in countries. But given our current technologies, is a similar system so hard to imagine today? Maybe Bitcoin can be the asset that leads the way in this direction, thanks to its cryptographic properties, but also thanks to the added benefit of its passive properties, including the fact users need to educate themselves, which can only benefit them and our society. We're working on a documentary project that will explore the actors that are trying to block Bitcoin adoption in the world. Remember to check our fundraiser. I believe that when the next global financial crisis happens, it's not going to be just a crash. The next crisis could be the greatest economic depression in modern time. But on the other side of every crisis is opportunity. Here's a 30 second background. The national debt of the US hovers around 21.7 trillion US dollars. There is absolutely no way to pay back all that money. So in order to deal with this immense shortage of cash, the US will need to do two things. First, they will have to borrow an additional $1 trillion per year. Second, they will have to create large amounts of new currency. The big banks like to use a fancy word for creating massive amounts of new currency, and that is quantitative easing, or QE. The problem is that all this new currency comes from nothing. It's created out of thin air. Poof, that's more debt. 
and borrowing currency from other countries obviously also creates more debt. An ever increasing debt is unsustainable and inevitably leads to a crash. Why? Because all this excess currency has created a debt bubble and debt bubbles pop. And when this debt bubble pops, there's going to be a financial crisis like nothing we've ever seen before. Why? Because the US dollar is the largest bubble we have ever seen in human history. The bigger the bubble, the harder to fall. The coming economic collapse could therefore be an economic apocalypse. But here's the thing, the crash can be withheld and pushed into the future by borrowing and creating even more currency, which is what the banks are doing. They refuse to suffer the hangover and instead keep drinking. But here's the good news, Bitcoin doesn't care about the world economy. Bitcoin is the best expression of money the world has ever seen and Bitcoin will succeed regardless of what any bank or government does. But the coming crash will act as a catalyst for Bitcoin's adoption because the crash will cause widespread disbelief in the current monetary system. And I believe that there will be a stampede to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible when people realize that fiat is worthless and that wealth cannot be stored in fiat because fiat keeps losing value through the ever increasing creation of more fiat. So they will turn to Bitcoin to preserve their wealth. Why Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is the hardest money the world has ever seen and people always return to hard money in times of economic crisis. What is hard money? Hard money is a money where it's difficult to create more of that money. Fiat is easy money. By the push of a button, you can create billions of dollars and the banks and the governments do this. Gold is much harder money than fiat. It's expensive and labor intensive to get gold out of the ground. But if gold's purchasing power increase, it would make economic sense to dig up more of it. And so more gold would be added to the supply. And there could be massive amounts of gold in the oceans that could further dilute the supply once we have the technology to dig it up. Bitcoin is much harder money than gold. Here's why. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin and they cannot be created at any faster pace than they are. The total supply and the issuance rate is predictable and predetermined. Every four years, the issuance rate of Bitcoin is cut in half. So in the beginning, 50 Bitcoins were created every 10 minutes. Four years later, 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. Now we get 12.5 Bitcoins every 10 minutes and so on until we have 21 million Bitcoins, which will be in the year 2140. There is nothing anyone can ever do to either increase the supply or increase the issuance rate. This makes Bitcoin the hardest money that has ever existed. When we have an invention of this magnitude in par with events like the invention of the printing press, the moon landing and the invention of the internet, timing determines impact. If the iPhone had been invented in the 1600s, it simply couldn't have succeeded. And Bitcoin could not have had any better timing. And I say this with confidence for three reasons. First, We've been on the brink of an economic collapse for years, and when the collapse happens, it's going to be a catalyst for Bitcoin adoption. Second, a change in the monetary system is well overdue. Fiat have a 100% failure rate throughout history. All the fiat money that have ever existed have all gone to zero. The dollar, the euro, the Swedish krona are no exceptions. These fiat currencies too are going to zero. And third, Bitcoin is the best expression of money the world has ever seen and the hardest type of money ever created. The future is incredibly exciting. More wealth will be created in Bitcoin over the next 10 years than over the prior 10 years. But remember, like any success story, it's not going to be a straight line up. Keep studying, keep believing and just be patient. I, I plan my personal finances, family finances and company finances sort of with a expectation that there's a 90% chance we have sat cent parity before the end of the decade. So a million dollars a coin by 2030, I think there's like a 90% chance. There's also a good chance it's like higher that than that, mission. but I, I should say like, I think there's only about a 10% chance that we don't hit a million dollars before then. Um, I've also said quite a bit and I feel pretty confident that you'll be able to buy you'll be able to pay for most goods and services around the world 
denominated in Satoshis by 2035. So Francis, you made this game, right? Yes. You are the creator. Oh. Yes. What this is all about? It's a, a snake game. Yes. But it's an analogy of the blockchain. So we call it Chain Duo. Okay. Because the snakes look more or less like a chain, you see? Uh-huh, yes. Mm. Uh, let's show them how it starts. Show us, Laura. I get a regular lighting wallet. Phoenix in this case. I scan this. Then I put a message, my name, uh -huh. and look. My name is in here now. So fun. It's awesome. super cool. And those are your 3,000 songs. Yes. Proof of snake. St I proof told you, it's proof of snake. <laughs> ah, this is the consensus protocol that it's going to change the world. Yeah. Proof <laughs> of snake. Don't trust big banks or small banks. Banks are Ponzi schemes run by morons. Hi, my name is Alex Gladstein. I am a human rights advocate from the United States. And I help people understand the connection between freedom and Bitcoin. So my first question about yes. Bitcoin. How would you explain Bitcoin to a small child? Bitcoin is a way to send value to anyone else in the world like an email. Before Bitcoin, you couldn't send money like an email. You had to use the bank and go to like the DMV and use all this bureaucracy and you had to pay a lot of money and you had to wait, um, which is not usually something kids like to do. You want it now, right? So Bitcoin allows you to have it now. You can give money now to anyone in the world now. Um, and I think kids really appreciate that. Yeah. And you don't have to ask your parents for permission. Any kid can have a Bitcoin wallet. There's no age requirement. You don't need to be 16 or 18 or 20. A 10 year old, as you know, can own Bitcoin and it can be your private property. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think kids would love that. Yeah, exactly. That's another way of them earning money and then they'll just be showing it off at school. Yeah, and I, again, it's the fact that you don't have to ask for permission. It's not something that adults grant you. All humans have the innate ability to use Bitcoin. It's kind of like knowledge, right? Like someone has to teach you how to read, your parents or your teachers. Or, um, so you're not born with knowledge, but you, you get help from society to unlock it, and then you go on your path. Bitcoin's the same way. You're not born with an understanding of how to use Bitcoin, but you learn about it, and then you can like, improve your freedom. So it's something that I really encourage young people to learn about, and I hope that my children will learn when they're your age. That would be wonderful. So another question. Yeah. Would you rather mine Bitcoin or buy it? Uh, mining Bitcoin is, is, I would say, either something you kind of have to do as a business or as a hobby. Uh, it requires like cheap electricity, so you know maybe you have a solar panel, or maybe you live near a river. Or, I mean, it's a little bit something that's going to be uh, only a small percentage of Bitcoin users are going to mine. Uh, I think the best way is actually to earn Bitcoin. That's my favorite way of getting Bitcoin. Mining is a little tricky. Buying often in involves like giving your ID and dealing with some company. But if you do something and, and someone pays you in Bitcoin, that's the best. Because then you're earning it. And it's like it, it's, it feels better than earning CDs or dollars or whatever. It's better to earn Bitcoin, yeah. I agree with you completely. Yeah. So my last question, sure. do you have any encouraging words for kids and adults? Yeah, very encouraging. We're headed to a world where money is a freedom tool. Money's always been a way to control people. I mean, we don't even have the ability to begin to comprehend what the world will look like in 10, 20 years once we have freedom money. Right now it's just small, it's growing. But as you can see, there's a lot of people who believe in this and they're from all over the world. So we're gonna make it happen. Be optimistic. This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit about deflation and the very bright Bitcoin future that we have in store for us. This is a follow-up to yesterday's video where I talked about future inflation in the U.S. and how that would affect an ultimate nominal price target for Bitcoin. So I do encourage you to watch that video. I think if you're a Bitcoiner, you'll be very happy by the, the ultimate price targets that I come up with. But in this video, I wanna talk about what does the future on a Bitcoin standard look like? This is a very big question. And so we're gonna be tackling just a very small sliver of this. And in order to do that, we're actually gonna take a historical journey back to 1789, which is when really the last of the Eastern seaboard states ratified the US Constitution. And the end, the end point for our journey will be 1913, 
when the Federal, Federal Reserve, which is a central bank in the U.S., was set up in a very stealthy and unethical way. So this is approximately 124 years. And we can see here, this is a measurement of the purchasing power of $1 over that period. The average inflation rate over that period was very, very close to zero. It was just 0.1% per year. That's not 1%. That's not 10%. That's one tenth of 1% per year, leading to total inflation over 124 years of just 12.5%. Now in 2022 in the US, if you were to measure the real inflation rate rather than the manipulated CPI number that the BLS puts out in the US, I'm sure that inflation just in 2022 was more than 12.5%. So it was just as bad as what you had over 124 years. So this was a very prosperous period. It was a period with some swings between inflation and deflation. And these swings basically canceled each other out because the US was essentially on a gold standard. So you had some booms and busts, but you certainly did not have real inflation. If we compare that to what inflation has looked like, even using the manipulated CPI number over the past 20 years in the US, we can see that the inflation rate has been really mid single digits. We had the 2010s were fairly low CPI inflation, and then it's come roaring back into the high single digits. According to this manipulated government statistic, the real inflation rate, as we all know, is much higher than this. So what's the difference here? Why was the inflation rate so low in the 19th century and now it's so uh, it's been so high well basically we had the federal reserve was founded in 1913 we can see here how the do the dollar has been devalued by money printing and by leaving a sound money standard like the gold standard over that period of time one dollar in 1913 now basically is only worth a few dollars or a few cents we've had a complete devaluation of the dollar and this really contrasts with the stability of the dollar from 1789 to 1913, when a dollar at the end of the period was really worth approximately uh, the same amount. You had very, very little inflation. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Maybe leave a comment as well with a question or a suggestion for a future topic. So this period, 1789 to 1913, 1913, the founding of the Federal Reserve, we basically had 124 years of basically zero inflation in the US. And as we said, over this period of time, the standard of living for the average American went up a lot. Why was this? In part, I would say it was mostly because of technology. And technology just means doing more with less. So for example, the 19th century saw the invention of the cotton gin, the industrial, industrial revolution coming to the US, factories, the light bulb, all of Edison's invest, inventions, Tesla's inventions, etc. So the thing about technology is it's inherently deflationary. In other words, it's cheaper to send an email than to mail a letter. This is what technology helps with. It also gives people more leisure time. For example, software and robots doing more work, automation doing more work, etc. So the real question is, why does the average American family in 2023 now need to work harder than ever before to afford basic things that previous generations like the baby boomer gen generation took for granted? How are they able to afford to have uh, some, or even the, the silent generation before them? How was the, the, the wife or mother able to stay at home and the husband was able to afford a, a nice house and a nice car, a new car every year, etc.? cetera? Uh, were people, did people work harder back then? I don't think so. Something has, has fundamentally changed. And I think it is because our life energy, the fruits of our labor, our earnings and savings have been stolen and are being stolen through taxes and inflation. One problem with inflation is you end up paying higher taxes because you get a raise, you get a salary raise that puts you into a higher tax bracket. So your wages are higher, but everything costs more too. So it's a net negative, especially when you get moved to a higher tax bracket. Inflation, you can basically define as your money buys you less stuff. In other words, less or fewer goods, services, and assets. Deflation, your money buys you more stuff, goods, services, and assets. Now put this way, deflation actually sounds like a great thing. So the question is, why are we taught in school that it's such a bad, bad thing? And why do we read in the mainstream media that's a bad thing? Well, the main reason is because the mainstream media really has become a megaphone for the powers that be, for the US government. And then of course the schools are government controlled. Instead of saying public school, I always like to say government school. I think it sums up much better 
what you get. And I can say this even as a child of, of public schools. I went to public schools at first and then went to private schools. Private schools usually are government funded and they take their cue as well from what the powers that be tell you that you need to teach. And so it makes sense that economics taught in high school and at the university and graduate level talks about deflation as being a very bad thing because these schools are basically highly influenced by government policy. What does the government have to deal with? The government has to deal with a lot of debt. Currently, the US national debt, not counting all the entitlement spending that's gonna to need to happen and all the off balance sheet debt, US national debt is almost, almost 32 trillion. And so deflation, when you have this much debt, deflation actually is a very dangerous thing. So we could see why we are indoctrinated in school to believe that deflation is a bad thing when it's actually a good thing for individuals and for families when your money buys you more stuff. Why is deflation a bad thing for those with lots of debt like the US government? Well, let's use a personal example. Let's say that you borrow $200,000 at a 6% annual interest rate. That's $12,000 per year in interest or approximately $1,000 per month in interest. Let's say that you currently make $60,000 per year. We're going to ignore taxes to make the calculation easy. That means you're currently paying 20% of your salary towards interest. That's just $12,000 uh, per year in interest divided by $60,000 salary. In a truly deflationary environment, you would expect wages and salaries to move down as well. So let's say that the following year, you're only making 50,000 because $50,000 salary because there's deflation. That means you're now paying 24% of your salary towards interest payments. In other words, the cost of servicing your debt has gone up. And this is the toxic cocktail of debt and deflation. By contrast, when there's inflation, the cost of servicing your debt gets easier because your wages, at least theoretically, go up every year. The working class and the middle class has been left behind uh, in part due to central bank policies and uh, policies that encourage wealth inequality, like outsourcing everything to China, for example. But at least theoretically, your wages would go up every year. And this has certainly been true for the upper middle class and the wealthier people. Do you know what else goes up in price every year, though, when there's inflation? Your wages may go up, but the price of food, the cost of food and gas, health care, rent, housing prices, etc., they all go up as well. So to summarize, inflation, good for those with lots of debt, like the U.S. government. Deflation, bad for those with lots of debt, like the U.S. government. Due to its high debt load, the U.S. government is, is incentivized to keep harvesting its citizens' life energy through inflation, which is a stealthy form of taxation. Really, the stupidest idea in ec economics is that money is only good when it loses value every year. That's another way of saying that the economy needs some inflation. You'll read these New York Times editorials by people like uh, Paul Krugman, for example, saying that 2% inflation is good. 2% 2 2 inflation is actually a terrible thing. It completely penalizes savers and it eats into your saving. So this is really one of the worst ideas. And it really is government propaganda that money is only good when it loses value every year. Now, this is something that Bitcoin fixes already today and in the future under a Bitcoin standard. And if you've been living on a Bitcoin standard and storing your savings, at least in part in Bitcoin, you have seen over the, the over multi-year time periods, your Bitcoin should buy more and more goods and services over time. Obviously, there are bear markets in Bitcoin. You can have these large drawdowns, but even these drawdowns tend to end at a higher level than the previous high. So even right now at 23,000, we're above the previous highs of the previous cycle. So Bitcoin has the tendency to allow you to buy more and more goods and services over time. This is why people will say it's a deflationary currency, for example. It's also a deflationary currency in the sense that more and more Bitcoin get lost every year, which makes the value of the Bitcoin that are still around uh, more valuable. So is it a bad thing that Bitcoin buys you more and more over time? No, it's actually a really good thing. In this sense, deflation is a good thing. Now, what about that personal debt that you may be holding? And a lot of Americans have a lot of debt. They've been loaded up with a lot of student debt, for example, which is part of the propaganda. Basically, you teach people worthless subjects at university, and you teach them uh, propaganda, and you load them up with student loans. And then the Wall Street is very happy about this because then they get to play games and package up the student loans, for example. And under U.S. law, you're not under, uh, under U.S. bankruptcy law now, you're not even allowed to discharge student debt under um, when you, if you file 
file for bankruptcy. So this is a real, this is a real travesty, and this is a real injustice towards the younger generations. So if you're holding a lot of personal debt, this is the tricky part. How are we going to make this transition from a fiat standard to a Bitcoin standard? Your debt is someone else's asset. In other words, you owe money towards your student loan, for example, and then someone else holds that loan as an income producing asset. So it's a little difficult. You could just forgive the debt. Uh, but if you do that, then it wipes the asset off of someone else's balance sheet. Now, this might not be a bad thing if it's Goldman Sachs's balance sheet, but it could also be another retiree, for example, who is just holding uh, some income producing bonds that are backed by student loans. So this is going to be a very messy transition. We'll probably see very high sustained inflation followed by a monetary reset or some sort of debt jubilee. It's hard to know the path, but this, these are the two main forces, the competing forces in the world today. Technology continues to make everything less expensive every year. Computers get more powerful. We have Moore's Law, and we also have automation and various forms of technology that allow people to live longer and allow people to do more with less. On the other hand, central banks and their monetary policy and their money printers make everything more expensive every year. So these are the two competing forces, technology trying to make things cheaper, central banks trying to make things more expensive in order to cause some inflation and allow the US government and other governments to service their debt. If you haven't read it already, Jeff Booth has a great book called The Price of Tomorrow, which I'm borrowing a lot from in this summary. If Bitcoin wins, it destroys the current de debt-based system and it will usher in an era of abundance where technology is freed to continue to lower prices without central banks ruining everything. In fact, it might look a lot like the 19th century, like 19th century America, which was on a sound money standard, and we saw very low inflation. We almost saw deflation at times, but everything seemed to even itself out. So this is what I'm hopeful for. This is one reason I hope that we can move to a Bitcoin standard during my lifetime. I think it will bring general prosperity to working class, middle class, and upper class people, and it will become, it will lead us to a much more fair system simply because everything will be grounded rather than being grounded in on debt and built on debt where you need to constantly be inflating your way out of the debt it'll be built on a sound foundation of a bitcoin standard if you found this video helpful be sure to hit that subscribe and like button hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when i publish my next video and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below thanks all for watching and i'll see you in the next video